Welcome to our last topic in chapter four. In this topic, we're going to talk about how proteins are studied. Now, in a lot of classes that you've had before, we've talked, you've probably talked about experimental design and things like that, and it hasn't really gone anywhere. It hasn't been a big focus of the class, but I want you to be aware that we're going to be doing a lot of assay discussion and how these assays work in this class because it's critical. As um, soon to be upper division students, it's really important that you understand how these assays work because you're going to start encountering them in the lab, and a lot of them you're going to actually do in the lab this semester as well. So these are just as important aspects of our course as the content that we learned in the other sections. So make sure you give topic three just as much time as you gave topic one and two for chapter four. This topic is all about how we study proteins. And remember, the field of proteins that we study is called proteomics. So this is all about how proteomics is conducted. The best part is we only have one objective for this um, topic. However, this objective is really broad and fairly nebulous. So if you want some practice on this or if you're feeling like you're struggling a little bit, let me know so we can work through this objective. So in this topic, we're going to talk about how we study proteins. And there's a couple main um, assays we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about cell culture, talk about Western blot. We're going to talk about x-ray crystallography, NMR, MALDI-TOF, and genetic engineering. So first of all, let's talk about cell culture. Cell culture is the most basic method of protein assays available to us. And this goes back to that model organism talk we talked about before, is that it's easy for us to be able to work in a somewhat systematic environment within the cell, right? But anytime we need to go into a bigger system, um, if we want to talk about how a drug impacts the immune system, obviously cell culture won't work for us because cells don't have an immune system. But we can work on a one cell basis in this case, and we'll actually have a whole plate of cells and we can see how things work in them. Cell culture is a really strict environment. It needs CO2 and specific temperatures and very specific media and there's a whole wide range of media and a whole wide range of supplements in order to get your cells to grow as you want them to or in that environment. So it's really important that you understand that. Cell culture is one of the main places that all research begins and you probably won't get your hands on a million cell culture um, anytime soon. It's usually restricted to um, senior level students or even graduate students because it is so finicky. If you do get an opportunity to spend some time in a mammalian cell culture, I encourage you to, to take advantage of it because it is a skill set that will carry you far in your career. There's also a wide range of cells you can work with and so it's important you understand that as well. And there's a lot that goes into the selection of a specific cell. So if you're curious about the different types of cells that are available, go onto the internet and look up the ATCC, which is the American Tissue Culture Collection, and you'll see just the thousands of cells that are available for use in the United States. And this is one of the primary vendors for cell culture. One of the things about working with cells is that we can then go ahead and let them produce things for us. Much like how we use E. coli to make insulin for um, diabetics, we can get these cells to produce proteins we need, and then we can go ahead and purify these proteins. And this can, we can also use bacterial cells to do the protein purification as well. But remember, the key is always in the model organism. Are the bacterial cells capable of producing the protein you need, or do you need to use mammalian cells to produce those proteins? And so once we have a stock grown up, we need to purify it, right? Because otherwise you just have this big slurry of cell bits and protein and everything else. So we want to make sure that we get a, um, a purified mix. And we use column chromatography is one of the key examples. And this is something you'll do in lab this semester. And there's three types of column chromatography. There's ion exchange chromatography, gel filtration uh, chromatography, and affinity chromatography. Now I want you to review all three of these for their and compare and contrast the different types because there's a reason why you'd use one versus the other. And I want to see if you can figure that out. And we'll talk about them in class if you want to work through them a little bit more. Or, and we'll double check to make sure we got a good handle on them. But I want you to see, um, look through them and see if you can think about why you would use ion exchange versus gel filtration. Concentration. What we do then, so we have purified proteins, um, is another key thing that we'll do to study proteins is a western blot. Western blots are a lot like regular gel electrophoresis, which you've done in many of your classes before, where you've separated out nucleic acid sequences, um, lengths of nucleic acids. Western blots, we do the same thing, but we separate out proteins. And as you can see here, western blots are run in a vertical fashion as opposed to the uh, nucleic acid gels that are run horizontally. So we load the uh, proteins on there, and the first thing we do with them is we have to break them down, because remember, we have these proteins are 
um, all folded up. And that means that they would run weird. We would we'd have a hard time telling the difference between a single protein and a bigger one. So we have to break them, break our dulse, disulfide bonds. And we also have to um, help put a negative charge on them so that the charge of the uh, Western blot equipment will actually help them move through. And then this will pass through and we can see the different sizes of the proteins. And you can either visualize all the proteins if you want to look at everything in your sample. Or if you have specific antibodies, you can detect the specific antibodies. Now one cool addition to this is some new variations that are coming out. And there's two main ones. Um, and they're not used all that often, but they're becoming more and more common. The first is isoelectric focusing. This is where we'll focus uh, proteins based on their pH, because there's a place in which the proteins become a neutral charge within a pH range. And this helps us separate those proteins by pH rather than, as you just saw on the previous slide, where we only separate by size. Now, if we combine both of these techniques, separating by pH and separating by size, we then get a two-dimensional gel, and, or a Western, a two-dimensional Western blot. And this allows us to see a lot more specificity in the, gel, or in the proteins. Because remember before, in a traditional Western blot, if I have three proteins that are all 42 kilodaltons, I can't tell if they're all there, except for maybe with the antibody um, bands, but there is always maybe some cross-reactivity. Whereas with this, I'm going to get a lot more specific protein visualization. Now, one of the best parts about these 2D gels is that I can load one set of samples from a control animal or control cells, one set of samples from the treated cells, and if I've dyed one set green and one set red, I can overlap and I can look for where there's a difference or where there's similar similarities depending on what I'm looking for. And that's where you can see in this picture on the bottom of the slide. In this case, the green dots are one set, the red dots are another set, and anywhere there's yellow is where there's overlap. So in that case, if I was wanting to see what happens when I treat an animal with this drug, then I would look for those those identify or those isolated proteins that are only from the animals that are treated, and use the control to help weed out all the other proteins. So it's a way to really give us a big leg up in proteomics, but it's still being developed, it's still being refined a little bit, but it's pretty neat technology. Another thing that is another tool that's used in proteomics is X-ray crystallography. And in X-ray crystallography, we can actually determine the shape of the protein. And this helps us actually see how these work through. And it's a very complicated process, and this is not the time or the place for it. But I encourage you, if you're interested, to go and look up some more information about this. Or there's several X-ray crystallographers working over at ISU Meridian that would give you an opportunity to see, um, to learn a little bit more about it as well, if you're interested. But one of the things about it is that an X or how this works is that an X-ray, beams of X-rays are passed through a protein crystal. And these crystals are grown up in a purified um, solution so that they make, we make sure that the, this is that we know exactly what it is. And these X-rays are passed through the crystal, and based on the diffraction pattern, we can actually tell how the protein structures work. Now, it's not that simple. It's not like we get this pretty ribbon drawing. There's a lot of math and Fourier transformations that go into it. So it's important to understand that it's not. Um, as simple as you think it is, but it's a really nice technique that helps us and it's brought our, the field of proteomics a long ways. Another one, um, and this is kind of the shortcut to help us get in there um, because extra crystallography is time intensive and expensive, is NMR. And you may have heard of NMR in your chemistry classes, but what MNR, NMR allows us to do is by bombarding it with radio waves, we can determine the distance between atoms. And this allows us to start to guess at what the shape of that protein is. Whereas extra crystallography gives us a lot more of a definite answer. NMR is still, um, it's a little bit of an easier way to get a step in the right direction. Another thing um, that we use is called MALDI-TOF, which is a, a matrix-assisted laser deionized ionized time of flight. And that's a lot. Basically what we do is we have these proteins and we shoot them with a laser and we look and see how long and how far they fly. And it uses a mass to charge ratio to help us determine this. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to figure out exactly what that protein is. So going back to that two-dimensional Western blot I mentioned, the 2D digi, um, if we were to extract a protein from there, then we don't know what it is at this point. We can put it through Molitoff and it would provide us an identification because we can compare it to other um, proteins that we've already run through and see what it matches. And so that is another tool that helps us actually identify those proteins from before. And one last thing, and this kind of circles back to everything we've been talking about because genetic engineering is the key to anything else that we do, is 
helping us produce a variety of proteins and other molecular tools. Now we use E. coli a lot and that's because E. coli grows fast. We don't have to worry too much about contamination. Um, but it's important that we recognize the E. coli is not the best answer for everything. Um, it depend The E. coli needs to be able to produce the um, the proteins. While it does work for a lot of tools, it doesn't uh, work for all tools. So it's just important to understand that. But what we can do is we can make these vectors with the sequence that we want to add into a cell, put it in there, and the cell will start to produce it. And this is a way we can modify those sequences. So we can create genetic mutants if we were looking for a specific type of something. Um, in uh, For an example, in my research, I'm using this as a siRNA. I'm introducing a way to break down RNA of a protein that I want my cells to not be able to produce. And so I grew it up in E. coli, put it into my cells, and that's how that worked. So there's a lot of aspects of genetic engineering, and this field is exploding. This is definitely something you're going to come in contact with a lot in your future. So it's important to understand some of the keys about it now. But this is one of the things that is the backbone of your lab experiment this semester. So make sure that you have a good handle on how this principle works in lab as well as in lecture. So this is the end of the uh, chapter four. I know we covered a lot of information in all three of these topics. So make sure that you have a good handle on all the objectives and let me know what you want to work on in lecture so that we can go through them. See you in class.